Um, our organization, Haitian Families First, um, is really aiming to keep families together and to keep children who might have to be put in an orphanage or taken out of their family. Um, usually it's because of poverty and because of different things that come, come across the family that are unexpected and they can't deal with them. Um, so the goal is to provide the needs to provide whatever that family needs at that time to keep a child in the family rather than them having to give it up. So we do, um, we have a couple of different programs. Our main ones are like nutrition programs where um, we just provide a family with basic nutritional needs, um, help them with groceries for a little while, or um, our formula program, which provides families um, who a lot of times the mother has died in childbirth um, and there's another member of the family who's taking care of the baby and they need milk. Um, we provide that. We provide training also, so young mothers or mothers who are inexperienced who need help with breastfeeding, for example, and just need some tips on how to do it and how to make the most of it. We provide that as well. Um, we have a, a space where we live, but it's, it's a bigger house, and we always have like teenage moms there or grandmas that just have never taken care of a formula fed baby and and they stay with us for a little while until they feel comfortable enough to to go home and you know so we always we constantly have people living with us <laughs> that's yeah we really want to to make an effect on the communities that we serve not just the families um, but you know people who have been in our program for several years now are turning around and and giving back to their community. We have some women who, they don't even call us to tell us they're doing this, but they'll say, oh, a lady came and she didn't know how to breastfeed, and so I showed her everything that you showed me. And that's, that's so neat to us, because imagine if, you know, we, we were able to make an impact on a community to the point that we didn't even need to be there anymore. Mm -hmm. And we can move on to the next place that needs our help. Um, and I think people appreciate that we are so hands-on and we're on the ground showing them and teaching them and being there like literally with our arm around them helping them up and they're able to say you know what they helped me get back on my feet and I want to turn around and do that for my my neighbor you know we actually have one woman that we've been working with for five years and she adopted a little baby this year that was abandoned at the hospital which five years ago she was trying to give her baby because she felt like she couldn't take care of her. And so now, you know, the baby's 10 months old, he's great, and, you know, she's just in a better place. But she saw. And we didn't even. Need. We didn't say it. We didn't no, tell her to she do called that. us and said, There's a little baby, and I want to adopt him. And we were like, Really? Yeah. And she, you know, she did that without even our encouragement. No, she had our encouragement, but without our prompting or anything. It was just natural to her that she she can give back now so she will mm -hmm. and now that child has a happy healthy home in Haiti in his country you know so that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> that makes us excited <laughs> this community and hears about someone else that's pregnant or and says there's no way I can do this I have too many kids and she says yeah you can breastfeeding is free and I'll help you if you need a babysitter you know We'll find a school that you can afford and, and just to encourage each other because it, it is really hard. It's hard to be poor anywhere and it's really hard to be poor in Haiti. And, but for these moms to work together and encourage each other, one of the communities we work in, they have like a communal daycare where two of them go to market this day and they watch each other's kids. And it's just something that we kind of suggested, but they, they never, they're not family and now they work together and, and all the kids are healthy and fine and you know they have a place to go during the day and the older kids go to school and it's just they're working this stuff out by themselves they just needed someone to be to say you can do it and now they're saying it to each other and that's great so it's it's like we're helping these families but they're helping so many families that it's you know it's just spreading and it's it's cool okay so if you're if you're in the United States and you can't afford formula for your baby you can go on welfare or you can go to Catholic charities and there there are places that you can go and they'll help you with it in Haiti there's no your choices are watch your baby die put them give them away put them in an orphanage and someone will take care of them 
and we're one of the very few, if there are any others, yeah. um, organizations that that says, "No, keep your child, and we'll help you." And and it's not just formula. It's if if your child gets malaria and you can't afford to go to the hospital, somebody will take it and put it in an orphanage and pay the bills. But most people won't give the aid to treat the child. So. You know, it's not so different from here. People struggle. Like, people go through hard times. And especially, a lot of people we work with are young. Mm -hmm. Young mothers. Um, and I see it here. We, you know, we, I work on the north side with children that go through hard things. It's not so different, you know. Um, but they have, they need an option. They need something that they can fall back on besides being forced to face this decision. Do you want to give your child away so that he or she has a better life? Not a better life, a life. To so stay alive. A life at all. Yeah. Or can we help you give your child a better life with you? And I mean, I think anyone here that has a child or that loves children even, I don't have children, but I know that if I was faced with that decision, I don't, I don't know what I would do. I, nobody should face that decision, ever. Um, it was in 2002, and I actually was looking for a place to volunteer, and I wanted to work in an orphanage, um, or I didn't care if it was Haiti or not. I just, I just wanted to go somewhere. So this place offered me a, a job for three months uh, in an orphanage in Haiti, and I took it, and it was nothing. It wasn't what I expected. So what I found out was that most kids in orphanages in Haiti don't have to be in orphanages. They have families that want to take care of them but are just struggling with something. And that it's a very corrupt system that it's, it's money and adoptions run the business and so the, kid, the kids aren't the first priority, the families are not the first priority. It's the adopted families in other countries and money. And after three months, I didn't want to leave because I bonded with these kids and I saw that things could be a lot better. And so I decided to continue to work for the organization. And I did spend like four years back and forth from Pittsburgh to Haiti trying to help the families. And in 2006, I actually moved there because I realized things weren't ever going to change unless I was there. And so the reason why I stayed was because I wanted to help moms not have to give up their kids. Well, the first time I went was just to visit, like to see what she was going to be doing, and I was 15. Um, but I think that week, I spent a week there, and I knew I was going to live there. It was like something clicked in my brain. Um, and I knew I had to finish high school, so all through high school I was working, saving money. I knew my goal was to move there, and so... Um, I wasn't able to go as much as I would have liked to, you know, but Jamie would always keep me updated and I felt like I was there more than I was and then we moved there together in 06 right after I graduated high school. Well, it was really scary and we weren't home. We, we had three locations um, and we were out on our way to the market when it hit. So our initial reaction obviously was we saw everything around us crumbling. Um, and just figured that our houses had to, you know. Well, so we were able to evacuate the children who were in the process of adoption. Um, and there were a lot of children in the process of adoption. It wasn't just the orphanage that we worked in. Um, so those kids... I think kids, like 1,100 came to the States, but they went to other countries. And so, on. so those children um, left Haiti. Um, but as far as affecting the population, I don't know, it wasn't such a high number that, I don't know, it wasn't the main concern. It wasn't a big decision because while we were working in an orphanage, a lot of times families came to us and wanted to relinquish their children and we helped them find services so that they didn't have to because they didn't actually want to. They just, the circumstances in their life, they felt like that was their only option. So we had been doing that since 2002, encouraging people to keep their children and helping them find options for that. 2010, we just started our own nonprofit. Before that, we were using, like, 
a church that we went to helped us out financially for those kind of projects, but we didn't have an official nonprofit in the States. So that, that's really what changed. And we stopped working in the orphanage, so we focus all of our time now on that, which is where we were working towards in the first place, but it's just more official. Um, our main programs that we're working on right now are to help um, mostly struggling mothers that need help with um, basic nutritional needs. Um, we have a formula program for those that can't breastfeed. Um, and a lot of times that is if the mother dies in childbirth and someone else in the family is caring for the child. Um, an obvious need is milk and they can't provide that. Um, and then we provide help with education, um, paying tuition for schools and helping with all the additional costs that go along with that, like books and uniforms, um, kind of a little bit of everything. It's different for every family. And so what we kind of, I mean, it's very important to us that we assess each family and, um, you know. We spend a lot of time with them. We get to know them. Individually, and, yeah. Yeah. There are a few public schools just starting this year, so most most children don't go to school, and the ones that do, they're private schools, and so they, they caught, they're not expensive, but they're approximately three months of the average family's wage. So for each child, and usually they have more than one child, it's three months, plus you have to buy uniforms, you have to buy books, you have to buy shoes, and, and so it ends up being you're only working to send one of your children to school, and that often happens where a family has three kids and they choose one that, that actually gets to go to school. So we, we cover those costs. Also, whenever you send a child to school, you're losing a part of the family that helps out. So, you know, a little six-year-old child here would not be expected to help with, like, the wash and, you know, cooking and stuff, but that's part of life there. So whenever we, whenever we help just with education, for example, it, it doesn't end there. There's another need that needs to be met in that family. And we don't just hand the money for school and then leave them to figure out how to fill that void. We, we go all the way with them and help them to figure out how to take care of themselves. Um, not to depend on us, but just to, you know, get a hand up. Yeah, we really, we really need funds to continue to help the families. Um, Right now in our programs we have about 70 families, which is 130 or so kids that we're affecting. And some of those are, you know, kids with serious medical needs that we're at the hospital with them, you know, five days a week um, and getting treatments and things like that. And then it, it goes all the way down to a child that I think we might spend like $2 a month on that just needs a vitamin or something like that that they're not able to get or afford without our help. So, um, yeah, our, our main need right now is, is funds to keep coming in to help us keep supporting those families. And we have no shortage of families on our waiting list that, that need that help, too. I think we're, we're a unique organization. There's not a lot of people doing what we're doing down there. So when people hear that there's an organization that's providing basic social services and that kind of help, they're kind of lining up to get that. And we get, most of the families start with us in a very, in a crisis situation, like mom dying in childbirth or a child that's severely malnourished and almost dying in a hospital. And, but we don't want to stop, we don't want to take them to a place where they're healthy and then say, okay, you're on your own. We want to make sure that they have the skills they need to get a good education and find a job when they're 20. So we're starting with infants most of the time and working with them throughout their lives. And we have kids that are eight or nine years old that we've known since they were babies and you know, but we, we're staying with the family and and most of those eight or nine year olds we've found their parents' jobs. We don't really do much for them except, you know, visit every once in a while and make sure they're okay. But but we really that's that's our goal is to stay with the family and not just say we have a formula program, it's until you're twelve months and then we're done with you. We wanna make sure that that we're there throughout their life. And also, like, we really, really love these people. It's, I mean, if it was just a job, I don't think we could do it. If it was, like, go to work and go home at night, we couldn't do it. It's, 
they go home with us. They're, they're our friends. You know, some of these mothers are my age, and, like, we can sit and talk and relate. You know, Jamie was telling me when she was coming to visit for this week, all the women, the moms that we help were like, don't don't have too much fun there because you might not come back. Like, <laughs> we need you here. Don't get stuck in Pittsburgh. We know you're going to have a great time. So it's, it's very personal for us, you know, and that, I think, affects how we how much we care about them and how important it is that our work continues with them. And I think it makes us have a higher success rate because we have a, a real relationship with them. We go into their homes and we not only respect them, but they can tell that we actually care about them. And it's not what everybody does. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of clear that one of us needed to come back and kind of get, get the word out again that we're still there and that we're still doing this work. Um, you know, things move on and a lot of people's attention moves on because there's always need everywhere. So um, my goal in being here has been to just kind of rejuvenate that interest in our organization and in Haiti too. Um, and planning a couple of events that are coming up this fall. Our, our annual Tea Carnival event is going to be bigger and better than ever this year um, in early November. So we're trying to really put a lot of time and focus into that and obviously with my ultimate goal to get home <laughs> to Haiti because that's where to put together a team of people in Pittsburgh that that are working for us so that we can work there that's right that's the ultimate goal of her being here <laughs> we we definitely need just hands-on volunteers for events um, people who have connections and know people because we try not to for example, we don't want to pay for a venue for an organization whenever that money could obviously be better spent in Haiti. So we're looking for venues that are willing to donate. We're looking for people that have skills in planning. Um, and all of this is kind of happening. We had a big meeting the other night of planning and um, people who are volunteering, but it can all be done like through email and we're trying to get our, our Twitter and our Facebook and all of that are very active now. So people can find us there. And, definitely find out how to help. Um, if they want to find out more, um, HaitianFamiliesFirst.org is our website. But like I said, our Facebook is a great place. We have a page, Haitian Families First, and that's where we're kind of more interactive and we're updating that very often. You know, we really saw the support in Pittsburgh when we came back in 2010. And I always say, I don't know that if we were from any other city, if we would have gotten that. Because I think it's such a unique place and, you know, we're, we're Pittsburghers and people felt a connection because we're one of their own. And, um, and we felt that for a long time. And like I said a little bit earlier, I think, I think a lot of people would be surprised to even know that we're still there. Because we, you know, we went back to Haiti and we kind of disappeared from Pittsburgh. Um, so yeah, I think our main thing is just to let people know that we are still working there and that there's so many ways that they can help support. People can come see us. People can come, you know, see what we do and, and see the families that we're serving and see how real it is.